So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, thank you for coming. I'm Ed Remus, the social sciences librarian at Northeastern, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to this virtual event. Today's event is being co-sponsored by the NEIU Libraries and the NEIU History Department. Conversations like the one we're about to have are happening every day in the many history classes being taught here at Northeastern. For more information about the history classes being offered this spring, please visit the History Department website. I'll post the link in the chat right now. The spring 2022 class schedule is up on Newport and a printed schedule will be up soon on the History Department website. I also want to mention another virtual event being co-sponsored by the library and the History Department. It's a panel discussion titled, Who's Right to Bear Arms, Race and the Second Amendment? This panel will feature four historians with differing interpretations of the Second Amendment and its relation to race and racism in American history. That panel discussion will be taking place on Monday, November 15th at 4 p.m. via Zoom. For more information about that event, please visit the link I'm about to place in the chat. The Zoom link for that panel is forthcoming uh, on the link that I'm pasting in the chat right now. So please uh, join us for that as well. So now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Ashley Elrod. Ashley Elrod earned her MA and PhD in history from Duke University. She joined NEIU in 2018 as an assistant professor in the history department where she teaches courses on European history and disability history. She is not a lawyer, but her research explores the history of guardianship laws in Europe since the late middle ages and she is an avid Britney Spears fan. After Ashley's opening presentation, I'll moderate audience Q&A for the remainder of the event. And now please join me in welcoming Ashley Elrod. Thank you so much, Ed. All right, um, is my PowerPoint coming through clearly for you all? Okay, great. Um, I want to start with extending my thanks to the library and for the history department for hosting this event um, so that I can share with you my presentation today. I also just wanted to give a shout out to a very special guest, um, my mom, who's coming in from California on the Zooms. Mom, can you give a wave? Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. All right. So, as Ed said, I am a historian, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't offer you that particular expertise nor any inside scoops into the Brittany case that you may not have encountered already. But I think history offers a really powerful lens and adding that with a comparative perspective to seeing how guardianship has looked in different parts of the world and over time can really help us to understand our contemporary issues that we're observing. So to begin, um, this talk is titled Free Britney, Free Them All, Britney Spears and the History of Guardianship. Now, I suspect that many of us are, oh dear, there's a little bit of a, I'm sorry, let me see if I can clear that up. <laughs> um, is that a drawing on the screen? Uh, annotations, clear, there we go, clear all drawings. Okay, my apologies. All right, so um, my suspicion is that many of us um, are here today because of the dramatic increase in public attention to guardianship in recent years, both in the news media and in popular culture. Um, for example, what you see pictured here are the cover art for three documentaries about Spears's guardianship case, just from the last year alone, framing Britney Spears from February of this year, and two from September, controlling Britney Spears and Britney versus Spears. In addition to that, we see other portrayals of the guardian of guardianship within popular culture such as in this 2020 film, I Care A Lot, featuring Rosamund Pike and Peter Dinklage. And it's the story of this corrupt public guardian who exploits the elderly in order to seize their property. 
So it's, this is part of sort of the culture of how we are perceiving and understanding Spears's case. And so I want to introduce to you um, some of how my own background in history and disability um, activism informs my own understanding of the Spears case. This is the overview of the talk I'd like to share today. We'll begin with an introduction to Britney Spears's conservatorship, including a definition of that word. Um, I will introduce some tools for thinking about guardianship. We'll look at some of the historical research um, for examples of how that can inform our understanding of present problems and future possibilities for the guardianship system. So let's begin with an introduction. Britney Spears has been under guardianship since 2008 in California, what's called a conservatorship. Conservatorship is not a household word and that's apparent in just how often Americans began Googling the term beginning in 2020 with a really big pike in 2021 in the summer, just when Spears' own personal testimony was available in court in June. So this response to the increasing news coverage of Spears' case indicates the need for a common definition of what we mean by conservatorship. Conservatorship is a form of guardianship. And that's what I'm going to call it throughout my talk today because it allows for more consistency so I can make comparisons to other US states, countries, and historical eras. And as a starting definition for guardianship, I'm pulling from the state of California's judicial branch website, which I believe has been highly trafficked um, from people seeking to understand the Britney Spears case. The definition provided says that in a guardianship, situation, a judge appoints a responsible person or organization to care for another adult who cannot care for themselves or manage their own finances. So the court might appoint a guardian to oversee just the person's property or to oversee both the property and the person's general life, um, where they live, uh, how they live, um, aspects of their medical um, care and day-to-day -day living. Now Spears initially had guardians for both of those scenarios of the person and the property, although that has since shifted towards being a guardianship of property more recently. Yeah. One thing I want to call attention to and that we'll explore in more depth later on is that guardianship is a very old institution. Some of the laws that we use today trace their origins back to Roman law um, in antiquity and to late medieval English common law. And in that deeper history, we consistently see two key things happening with the creation of a guardianship. One is that it evaluates a person's capacity, right? And we see that with the phrasing of this um, posing questions like, are they responsible? Can they care for themselves? In addition to evaluating capacity, guardianship also transfers power. It deprives the, whether you call them the ward or the conservatee, it deprives the person of legal rights, and then it reassigns them to another person, in this case called the conservator. So in 2008, when Britney Spears was 26, her father, Jamie Spears, filed a successful petition with a California court to have himself declared as one of two guardians who would manage her personal life and her finances, which were then valued at about $50 million. The events that led up to her conservatorship um, are explored in depth in these two documentaries. And I really encourage you to watch them um, because they help show how stereotypes about gender and mental illness influenced how Spears was presented to the world. And this is important because the news media and that representation played an active role in creating and exacerbating some of the public scenes that would become prime evidence against Spears 
in the court of public opinion. Leading up to her um, being put under um, guardianship, Spears had been widely covered in the media for a couple big events in her life. Her divorce from K-Fed, backup dancer Kevin Federline, um, the custody battle over their two sons, which she initially lost, um, and her new attempts to establish um, a dating life. And this media coverage intensified in January 2008, when Spears was involuntarily committed to UCLA Medical Center on two occasions. And we see media outlets rather gleefully covering what they called Spears's psychodrama, her meltdowns, her bizarre behavior. One national newspaper described um, her life spiraling out of control. There are many images of Spears from this period. The most iconic of which you might remember captured her shaving her head in 2007. And I'm not going to show you any of those images today. Um, one, because they've already been widely publicized. They've been viewed millions of times. Um, but more importantly, and as I'll argue in this talk, those images are problematic examples of how we define what constitutes normal, sane, or competent behavior. So let's come back to that. For now, in the wake of these events from 2006 to 2008, Spears's father proposed that guardianship was the solution that would protect Spears from what they called predatory influences in her life and, in the words of um, one newspaper, protecting her from her own erratic behavior, right, which is we see represented in these, these terms that showed up in contemporary headlines. So now, in the year 2021, Britney Spears has been under guardianship for a total of 13 years from the time of her age 26 to age 39. So one very important reason why we're even talking about Britney Spears' case today is due to the ongoing resistance to her guardianship from two directions. One is from Spears herself. Um, it's been reported that she um, took various actions to quietly push for years to restore her rights. Um, and this was uh, captured powerfully this summer when she delivered an impassioned speech in court asking for release from guardianship. Another source of resistance is the Free Britney movement. It's a dedicated contingent of her fan base who have um, helped bring national attention to her fight for autonomy. Uh, through their public protests, like this one pictured here outside of an LA courthouse, as well as on um, social media in recent years. So when I was deciding how I wanted to organize this talk today, I realized that it's the public's response to the Britney Spears case that um, really shows what we need to think about more deeply. I think we can see two kinds of reactions to Spears's legal fight for autonomy. Much of the initial coverage focused on this first question, this first type of reaction. Should this specific person, Britney Spears, be under guardianship? Right, so Spears is often presented as what they're calling an atypical or far from typical person to put under guardianship. And what they mean, as one California guardianship lawyer put it, is, quote, you have to be unable to meet your needs for food, clothing, health, and shelter, end quote, for a guardianship to be appropriate. And so when covering the Britney Spears case or interviewing lawyers um, about her, uh, typically, what they emphasize is a few key factors about Spears um, that make her an unusual candidate for guardianship. And that includes her age. She was in her 20s at the time. Her physical health, uh, her wealth, uh, her apparent ability to care for herself on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And most of all, what they emphasize is her ability to work and to make millions doing so. Spears and her supporters emphasize that she has maintained a highly successful and what they describe as a grueling work schedule over the last decade. So one year after she was put under guardianship, Spears toured the world for nine months, performing for whole arenas of fans, like this one pictured here from Montreal in 2009, an average of every three to four days. Um, what I'm picturing here is a giant brightly lit arena with something like 23,000 people packed into this space. Uh, another image shows Britney Spears elevated above the stage with um, lots of fire going on on the stage underneath and various circus performers um, performing acrobatics. Uh, and now I'm picturing her in her ringmaster outfit um, as part of this massive nine month tour. So this is the year after she was put under guardianship in the ensuing years, she also continued to be highly productive as a performer. In a four year period from 2013 to 2017, um, she had a residency in Las Vegas where she put on 250 shows in this time, earning her about $138 million. And again, we have these images of fantastic stage performances spears and a striped bodysuit surrounded by a literal ring of fire um, and other instances um, being lowered down onto the stage onto what looks like a 15 foot tall platform wearing a giant angel costume with wings right so um, when she describes her own work performance and when her former employees have described spears's work life um, they really emphasize her deep involvement in directing these elaborate shows, designing the choreography, and teaching her dancers. And Spears herself really emphasizes her work life. In a court statement from June of this year, Spears expressed frustration about this, this dissonance between her work life, on the one hand, and her alleged incapacity. She said, it makes no sense whatsoever for the state of California to sit back and literally watch me make a living for so many people and be told I'm not good enough. So I want, I want to include a, a quick aside here. The relationship between wage earning work and disability is a really important one because there's been a fraught history of associating those two ideas. Um, there's a long history of assuming that disabled people cannot work or can't work productively, that disability is somehow equal to dependence in all occasions, or that dependence is a um, unnatural, um, abnormal thing, or that it disqualifies a person for rights. There's a lot to unpack there. So if this is of interest to you, please feel free to raise this in the question and answer period, because this is a really important theme from disability studies. So to sum up, when observers ask, ask this first question, should this specific person, Britney Spears, be put under guardianship? The implication is that she deserves better treatment, she deserves legal rights because she doesn't fit the established definition of an unfit person who needs guardianship. It's really looking at the Spears case in isolation. But there's a second kind of reaction to Spears's case, and that is to ask more generally, should guardianship function this way at all? Right? In other words, should anyone be under a guardianship that functions like hers has for the last 13 years? And this is taking a much more, a broader lens to understanding the issue. One very important role that Spears's case plays um, in these documentaries about her life, what they do is they highlight this severe potential for abuse and exploitation in the guardianship system. As one reporter reminds us in controlling Britney Spears, um, conservatorships 
are always supposed to be designed around serving the best interest of the conservatee. But that poses a really interesting question. What is the best interest of Brittany? And who's making those decisions? Um, it, it sounds like it has not been Spears from the public reporting on the case. Um, Spears did not have the legal right to express um, or represent her own interest in court hearings. Early on in the legal process, the California court determined that Spears was not, um, she wasn't mentally capable of retaining or choosing her own lawyer. So in that case, it would be the court, lawyers, and guardians who are tasked with deciding what her best interests are. Now, guardians are appointed to manage a ward's personal life, to have these broad powers with the intention that the guardians will use those powers to protect and serve their ward. But many allegations of abuse surfaced over the first, um, excuse me, over the past uh, year of, um, of, uh, of examinations of her case and interviews. So for example, Spears's former employees have come forward with allegations about highly invasive ways that her guardianship is affecting her life. Um, there's uh, one figure, Alex Vlasov, a former employee at the company that managed um, Spears' uh, security, who alleged that Spears was surveyed 24 seven, including hiding audio recording devices in her bedroom and monitoring her phone calls, text messages, and internet usage. Employees also alleged that Spears was denied the ability to um, choose where she went and drive herself where she wanted to go. And very importantly, um, uh, mitigated the access to her personal relationships, such as dating, friendships, and very importantly, access to her two sons. Through this private security firm, Spears' guardians also allegedly used that to supervise what medications she took, the choice of what food she ate from day to day, and whether she could access her personal credit cards um, for day-to-day -day purchases. And finally, Spears' case has also generated public outrage when she alleged that her guardians denied her the right to get married to remove the implanted birth control device um, that she currently has and to have children. So as she expressed in, um, in court in June of this year, she said, I deserve to have the same rights as anybody does by having a child, a family. So rather than focusing on Spears' case alone, the second question, should guardianship function like this? recognizes that there are deeply rooted problems with modern guardianship systems. And this is what prompted Representative Nancy Mace of South Carolina to co-sponsor new legislation that's intended to curb guardianship abuses at the federal level. I'm um, displaying right now a headline um, indicating this bipartisan bill coupled together with an image of Free Britney protesters. And when speaking about um, the genesis of this bill, Representative May said that the Britney Spears conservatorship, it's a nightmare. If this can happen to her, it can happen to anybody. So Spears' own legal battle has made us aware that this is a systemic nationwide problem. And I, I want to be clear about something here. Um, Spears' case is not the first time that we've seen it made public, right? That, that the public has been made aware of these problems. Um, we've had decades in which activists, journalists, and public officials have um, acknowledged the widespread abuses in the guardianship system. So I don't want us to pass over the gender, race, and class dynamics that are making Spears' experience so visible to us. Her global fame, um, as well as her status as an extremely wealthy white woman, is lending her a much greater visibility 
and sustained public attention compared to the millions of other uh, people who have been under guardianship and continue under guardianship. And it's this public attention that is extremely valuable for generating the support and momentum that's needed to make meaningful change within the guardianship system. So in the rest of my talk today, I wanna to provide you with a theoretical and historical framework for understanding the wider context of the Spears case, some of the social and ethical concepts that are at the core of guardianship, and perhaps the ways in which um, we can imagine a path forward for the future of guardianship with the assistance of history and um, the insights of current activism. So let's start with some tools for thinking about guardianship. So far, we've been talking about broad concepts and questions like, what does it mean to be responsible or competent? What are the criteria that we use to measure competence? And very importantly, how do we decide who should wield that power and make decisions about a person's life? We'll talk about two main concepts in this section, um, or two tools, I should say, disability studies and its intersections with other um, critical theory disciplines. The field of disability studies is a really helpful starting point for answering these questions. Uh, disability studies, um, just as a bit of background, is an interdisciplinary field, um, and it recognizes that concepts like disability, normality, sanity, these are social constructs. Societies use terms like these to categorize the population into binaries. We are able or disabled, we're competent or incompetent. And what's wrong with binaries? Well, these separations of um, people into things like rich and poor, masculine and feminine, they're really focusing on the extremes rather than the majority of human experience that lies somewhere in between. For disability, um, the reality is that there's an extraordinarily diverse spectrum of ways that human beings look, think, and behave. Um, but in our discourse, in the way we talk, we often frame disability as a binary. And that presumes that there's that there's like one coherent type of normal person, one normal body mind, and that any variations from that norm are categorized as disabled, impaired, or deficient. So disability studies, by, by studying how we talk and think about disability, have shown that a social construct like disability is an unstable, ever-changing category. It's going to vary from culture to culture. And so by acknowledging that disability and its opposite, normality, if we acknowledge that they're constructs, they allow us to better understand concepts that might otherwise be taken for granted. So at one point in Britney versus Spears, the narrators say, it's a story about power and control. And this is something else that we scholars of disability um, are able to provide us with important insights about how the concept of disability is connected to power. At its core, to have competence is to have the power to exercise important rights. And to be declared incompetent is to deprive the individual of those rights and reassign them to another. And this is a system that, I mean, it's explicitly sorting individuals into this binary based on our assumptions about who is fit to wield that power. And what are those assumptions? And that's where I'll address the second point. Um, let's see. Ah, I've missed a quote. All right. So um, when it comes to thinking about how we decide who is fit to wield rights. Um, I actually really like this powerful quote from Kim Nielsen, a prominent disability historian who writes that our standards of civic fitness, which are grounded in understandings of disability and ableness, 
have shaped democratic rights from the early years of the nation. Disability historians argue that using disability as a tool can teach us a lot about the development of democracy. But I would argue that guardianship law and these conversations about disability can be just as revealing about any nation because it really lays bare how that society assigns and withholds power, right? So we have to be aware of the differences between theory and practice. Legislation may generally state what competence is supposed to mean, but research um, in competency hearings shows that it's the family members, the lawyers, the doctors, the witnesses, the judges, who are actually interpreting the meaning of terms like competence. And scholars warn us that when we study these decisions about who is responsible, who is competent, this is not ideologically neutral ground in the words of one historian. In competency hearings, um, writes Nielsen, not surprisingly reflect a society's already existing power structures of gender, race, age, marital status, and bodily ability, right? So because disability is intersecting with these other factors, um, we're also seeing that definitions of who is fit and unfit change significantly over time and place. And so looking closer at intersectionality shows us that if we really want to understand disability and guardianship, we have to take into account how critical theory um, is showing us the ways in which guardianship intersects with sexism, racism, and these other prevailing ideological systems within whichever society that we are studying. All right, so let's move deeper into the past to get a sense of how guardianship and competence changes depending on time and place. So, I'm gonna provide a little bit of historical backdrop and weave in um, particularly the themes that help us understand our contemporary um, debates that center around the Spears case. Overall, um, it's important to reflect that guardianship is an ancient institution. We have to be aware of these long, deeply entrenched traditions because we continue to live with the legacies of them. The guardianship laws that most European states used in um, the modern period actually came from ancient Roman traditions dating back to Roman legal codes that are approximately 1500 to 2500 years old. In the late Middle Ages, many European states, especially on the continent, began, excuse me, the European continent, began to revive old Roman legal um, traditions and make them the basis of their modern law codes. And so we can think of this as a legal renaissance in which um, around the year 1400 and 1500, uh, European states adapted the Roman practices of guardianship and shepherded them into the modern era. We also see deep precedents with English common law um, where practices that were originally developed in late medieval England, um, such as the, uh, the principle of parents patriae, um, the foundation of um, much English-based um, uh, guardianship law, was able to um, develop from late medieval England and eventually spread to colonies in the US, Canada, and Australia. Um, so it's interesting to look at the general spacing of these points and to see um, the continuation of these deep traditions. In the time that we have today, we can't possibly do justice to this long tradition. So I want to focus on some important continuities in this long history that can help us to understand some of the problems we see today. Um, so overall, I'm going to pull from three main case studies on guardianship. This includes my own research, which focuses on guardianship in the German lands from 1400 to 1900. I also draw from the research of historian Elizabeth Mellon on Italy and the work of Kim Nielsen, who has focused on guardianship in the US in the 19th and 20th centuries. 
And I've chosen three main themes that I think are strongly represented in historical research, uh, but that also resonate really well with the Britney Spears case. The first theme um, that consistently appears in historical evidence is that guardianship has been used for a very broad category of people. And the idea of who is incompetent has also been highly um, contested and it's, it's very negotiable. It is a plastic concept um, in the sense of being able to be manipulated. So to illustrate this, um, I first wanna show you an example of who was typically put under guardianship. And we can consistently see that there are some main groups that appear in this category. So going through the list, um, we see that they also align with major categories of identity. So the first is age. Um, those uh, who were put under guardianship included minors. Um, and we can't take that for granted. We may place different ages on that in the present day. It might be 18 in some situations, perhaps 21. In Roman law, um, a minor was someone under the age of 25. Um, in some regions, they might place it at 21 in the early modern period. So however a given culture defines a minor, um, they might be more uh, subject to be put under guardianship. And it also includes the other end of that spectrum, the elderly, without a particular age to guide that point, but the assumption that um, guardianship was really something that occurred across the human lifespan. Another criteria that we need to take into account is gender. Um, in many historical eras um, in this period um, that I'm citing from, we see adult women especially unmarried women and widows uh, put under guardianships. This was especially true in the German lands, um, but around 1500, there was a revival of an older Roman practice of putting single women under the guardianship of a male relative or another appointed man. Um, uh, these women were otherwise referred to as masterless women. And so we can see there's actually a transition from um, the late Middle Ages into the early modern period where women's legal and economic rights contracted due to the revival of guardianship practices. Another factor, of course, to consider is disability. And this is a very loose category. Who is included under this heading has varied enormously over time, but in general, Guardianship was used for adults who were considered to have mental disabilities, sometimes labeled insane, mad, feeble-minded. Um, and it, it was quite a stretchy and flexible concept. It also included some physical disabilities. The ones that I see most represented in my own research um, tend to be deafness, especially congenital deafness, um, coupled with the inability to speak. Also people who are described as physically frail or having chronic illness um, surface repeatedly in conversations about guardianship. At this point, we also need to mix in another dynamic at play, and that is varying um, perceptions of morality, of what constitutes good moral behavior. Um, especially going more into the modern period, we see guardianship laws extended to people described as addicted to alcohol um, first, and then uh, later more references to guardianship for drug addiction. And finally, there is a whole separate category of adults who could be put under guardianship, and that is if they were just generally considered to be bad at managing their property. And they go by many names. Uh, sometimes they're called prodigals, spendthrifts, wastrels. Anyone out there who loves like the Victorian 19th century literature where there's some, um, some handsome rake who squanders all his wealth, right? That's the idea we're talking about here. The prodigal son who is put under guardianship to limit the risk that he poses to his family. 
So overall, we can see that there's a range of justifications for why past societies have put people under guardianship, but they all stem from the shared assumption that certain people, certain groups are less capable of independent decision-making. And that's primarily based on factors like age, gender, and ability. And I think there's a really important um, consequence of this grouping together of people. That consistent grouping effect um, is something that reinforces a paternalistic attitude towards people under guardianship. And this is a common stereotype of disability, which frames people with disabilities as childlike, right? It has this infantilization um, result. And we see that represented in the Brittany case. Um, this is one of the former employees interviewed for one of the documentaries who reported that um, Spears as head of security would tell her security team, she's just like a child and like any other minor who needs their parents' consent. Guardianship, um, as I think is indicated in some of these lists of who is subject to guardianship was also deeply shaped by each society's standards of what is good or moral behavior. In theory, competence is based on the question of whether a person can successfully care for themselves or care for their property, but there is no universal or objective definition of what good management looks like. So there's an extraordinary amount of room for disagreement um, when, when they interpret these terms. I think a great example of this comes from the work of historian Kim Nielsen, who conducted an 80-year study of incompetence hearings in Wisconsin from 1860 to 1940. And she found an extraordinary variety of reasons for why petitioners wanted to put someone under guardianship. She reported that the term incompetence served as a catch-all category with no set criteria. The result of that is that it allows country judges, excuse me, county judges to set their own community standards and to seek the opinions of family members, neighbors, and the occasional medical or asylum personnel about whether the person is competent. So it's important to note here that Competence hearings um, tended not to bring in a medical expert or rely solely on a medical expert. It was occasional and erratic in the 19th century, um, Nielsen finds, and well into the 20th century, we see it's only a gradual movement towards deferring to medical opinions. This is important because it means that there's a wide cast of characters who play a role in deciding who is competent, who can wield legal rights. It's not up to a medical diagnosis alone. And this is true in my own research on German trials, where that room for flexibility um, shows that competence was a highly negotiable and fluctuating concept. The courtroom ends up being the space where judges, families, witnesses, and the alleged incompetent person themselves could debate what exactly it means to be responsible. And my overall findings is that for many witnesses, competence was really more like a role that a person performed in their community. So for example, in one case from 1527, witnesses explained that when, um, they were evaluating a man's competence, a man who lived within their community. They based their conclusions just based on you know, what they observed about his behavior. He appeared to be of adult age. He ran his own independent household. He had children to raise. He served in public office and did business with many in the community. So it's stories like these, uh, of which there are many in the trial records, show that it's often less important to the community what a judge might have to say about competence and more important to them to observe how well they see an individual conforming to the expected social roles 
the obligations that they felt the person had to their community. And this brings me to a second theme that we see both in historical research and in the Spears case. Gender is a really important factor that shaped how courts defined competence. And um, this is evident also in the US research on incompetency hearings, which showed that conformity to heteronormative masculinity and femininity mattered enormously to judges' decision-making. We can see that judges, lawyers, and witnesses were focusing on how well a person was performing their gendered work roles. So for women in this 19th century US context, this might entail cleaning house, laundry, cooking, sewing, um, caring for livestock in a more rural context. In terms of male labor, the courts really targeted men who undermined their own masculine authority by spending too much on alcohol or neglecting their family. Um, this appears um, significantly across the early modern period as well, where incompetence was, is associated um, with what you know, Nielsen concludes about these incompetence hearings, which is that they were drenched in concerns about failed masculinity. So essentially we're seeing that families used guardianship as a way to force men to conform to their social roles. In one case from 1897, um, a Wisconsin court had initially um, removed the legal rights from a young man, but then later restored them when he uh, behaved in a fiscal manner that his parents considered appropriate for a responsible young white man. And I think what becomes apparent when we look at gender as a factor is that family is also playing a very large role in determining competence. In many cases, judges and families are defining competence um, in a way that historian Elizabeth Mellon calls patrimonial rationality. And she coined this term to refer to a different way that she sees people um, defining what is reasonable. Basically, the primary way that we're seeing um, these courts measuring a person's reason is based on how well the individual is conforming to um, a series of social rules that are focused on protecting the family estate, right? So, oh, <laughs> excuse me, my aggressive gesturing. All right, so um, that the family estate and the collective good um, supersedes the individual. So a good manager um, is defined in this context as conserving resources, avoiding risky debts. Um, they have to provide adequate support for their wives, children, and servants. And they need to make sure that they're keeping their property value intact or increasing it so that they can pass it on to their heirs. So what this means is to understand how they're defining competence, we need to step away from the way we might think about property in a more individualized, modern sense, right? Um, I can, you know, I own this and I can do whatever I want with it now in this moment, right? Instead, to understand how they're defining competence, we need to think from the perspective of family and community who felt that they had a stake in the individual's well-being. So the question becomes more, how is an individual fulfilling their social responsibilities to their household, um, to their heirs, um, and their community? So we're really thinking about a wider social context and a wider time scope, thinking of the future and people who may have future claims on that income. And this is why families were really active in monitoring their relatives' behavior and taking them to court as a way of influencing how they thought the, the property should be managed. So in my own research, I see family members accusing their relatives of incompetence for a range of reasons related to this. If, um, if their relative wasn't earning as much with the family business, if they appeared to be losing customers, if they 
um, weren't keeping up the property and it was falling into disrepair. Uh, family members also took their relatives to court if they thought that they'd um, made a bad business deal, like not charging enough for a sale um, or agreeing to a bad loan. Um, so there's a range of different reasons here. Um, uh, another one is selling off property that the family would have wanted to keep intact to transfer on to future heirs. Um, so overall, we're seeing that family members and especially the heirs are um, really keeping a watchful eye on the whoever is currently managing the estate. Um, and always with the expectation of thinking forward in time. And when we compare this more broadly, this really holds true in the US cases as well. Um, according to Nielsen and her research on the 19th and 20th centuries, incompetency hearings became one strategy to ensure that economic resources would stay inside the family or that um, one individual family member would take over control. So overall, historical research on guardianship is showing us that there are consistent problems with attempting to define competence, and especially with trying to come up with consistent objective criteria to measure who is competent. And we see that guardianship hearings are deeply influenced by social norms like gender and by family politics. A really um, important second issue that we haven't explored in as much depth is that of abuse. And that's where turning to the more recent history of guardianship in the last 50 years helps bring to light this um, really important issue in guardianship law, the potential for exploitation. And it was, it's really in response to these systemic problems that over the last 50 years, many nations around the world have pushed for serious comprehensive reform um, in the ways that our modern societies are deciding competence and reassigning power. So this brings us to the last portion of my talk today. Um, and that's really focusing on the last 50 years where we've seen a significant increase in public attention to guardianship. Um, and I am going to focus on presenting to you some of the, just the highlights and how guardianship has changed. And what I think very importantly here, the areas where the problems of past guardianship law remain with us as the legacy of the legal tradition we inherited. So this timeline here represents some of the major developments that have shifted the ways that we think about guardianship today. Um, and the most important of these that I want to draw your attention to on this blue timeline, which shows uh, five entries, the first one I want to direct your attention to is the disability civil rights movement from roughly the 1970s. Um, and what is really significant about the disability civil rights movement is that it was a coalition of disabled activists throughout the world who pushed for state protection from discrimination and for access to equal rights in areas like education, housing, um, political rights, transportation, and fundamentally just basic human rights. Um, I'm showing here a black and white um, image, a photograph from the 1990s portraying disability rights activists in um, a public march showing signs that say access is a civil right. And when it came to guardianship, one major goal of the disability civil rights movement focused on this question. How can we reimagine guardianship to prevent abuse and very importantly, to maximize the autonomy of the person? And I think the title of this slide, this phrase protection without paternalism really captures the overall goal of these reform movements. Going back to our timeline, um, the, the bottom part of the timeline is indicating um, some of the international activity where the United Nations um, was coordinating 
some of the collaboration between movements in different parts of the world. Um, so this started, for example, uh, one important example of this is the UN's declaration that the year 1981 would serve as the International Year of Disabled Persons. Um, and this was a way of encouraging member nations within the UN to pursue um, uh, movements and pushes for civil rights equality for disabled persons in their individual countries. This was um, expanded out into an entire decade, the decade of disabled persons, which went from 1983 to 1992. This reform energy uh, culminated in 2006 with an international treaty called the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It has been signed and ratified by um, almost 200 countries and the US is not one of them. Uh, the US signed the convention in 2009, um, but it has failed to ratify so far um, in Congress. So these are some of the international efforts. In North America, the United States and Canada have gone through a similar transition period since the 1980s. Um, and this um, especially began with a series of newspaper exposés uh, research studies and um, high profile scandals that really raised public awareness, similar to what's happening now with the Britney Spears case about these problems with the guardianship system. And one of the most influential of these uh, was um, a series of uh, exposés and newspapers, starting with the Associated Press in 1987, um, which reported on a series, of, um, a series of articles on troubling abuses in the guardianship system, calling uh, the system a dangerously burdened and troubled system that regularly puts seniors' lives in the hands of others with little or no evidence of necessity. Initially, a lot of the focus was on elderly rights. Um, and who, and this is highlighting a population who were highly vulnerable to financial exploitation through the guardianship system. Um, although we saw a, a, a lot of um, attention to this issue in the 1980s, it's certainly continuing into the present, such as this headline I'm sharing now from 2017 with um, the title, How the Elderly Lose Their Rights. So as a point of ongoing concern, headlines and um, legislative activity really reflected um, the recognition that reform was seriously needed. As one congressional representative stated that same year in 1987, the typical person under guardianship has fewer rights than the typical convicted felon. And the following decade witnessed efforts in individual states and in Congress to try to ensure protections for a due process, for self-determination, um, and of course, safeguards against abuse. The results have been mixed and uneven across the states. The US is made up of dozens of individual systems which um, only increases the challenge of making um, comprehensive reform on a national level. Over 20 years after you know, these initial flurries of concern, one state review still found that allegedly incompetent people were denied due process, they were denied representation by a lawyer, sometimes with um, you know, really severe results on the quality of the trial. So, most hearings in this review lasted 15 minutes and a quarter of the hearings of people's competence for guardianship lasted less than five minutes. And that is what led this um, legal review in the state of Utah to essentially compare it to some um, that, we, that we terminate this fundamental and basic legal right with all of the rigor of processing a traffic ticket. Right, so with this recognition of a real need for reform, I want to conclude with emphasizing the major trends and how guardianships have changed 
and some of the ways that we may wish to see them continuing to change. Right, so there are three major trends here that I think um, are representative of much of the reform um, efforts and which um, help us understand uh, some of what um, might have affected um, the outcome of the Spears case. Um, if we think about whether these reforms had happened more consistently or evenly across the states. So the first overall conclusion of um, reformers is that we need to redefine capacity and um, the scope of guardianship. So until this period of international reform, guardianship laws assumed that incapacitated people were just broadly incapable of making decisions and exercising rights. So it was sort of an across the board um, re, um, what is the term I'm looking for here? The restriction or removal of those broad rights. And this is what we call a plenary guardianship, where the guardian essentially took over all of the ward's rights and broadly restricted the autonomy of the person. In contrast, one of the major pushes for reform um, is uh, to focus on defining ca capacity by how well, um, excuse me, by how well a person performs specific functions or actions, like how well can I manage my own finances? Um, or how well can I make decisions about my health and healthcare? How well can I represent my own legal interests? We're looking at specific areas um, of decision-making and assessing them along these different criteria. And the idea is that the powers of my guardian should only be limited to those specific functions where I'm unable to um, perform at this time in my life. The goal of this rethinking of capacity is to try to leave as much personal choice in my control as possible. So there's a significant emphasis here on making guardianships limited, what they call limited or partial guardianships, and also flexibly adapting them to each person's case. And that's what leads into a second trend, which is to really explore guardianship options and alternatives. And the goal is to make a more flexible range of options that can be tailored for the best individual fit. Rather than using plenary guardianships in all cases, we're actually seeing um, many countries internationally are starting to adopt new models that include multiple degrees or hierarchies of guardianship that are supposed to correspond to varying levels of capacity. So we, we see this happening in Sweden. Um, in the late 1980s, Sweden basically abolished its entire guardianship system and built a new one from the ground up. And they included multiple tiers for, um, for guardianship of adults, for example. There was one tier called a custodianship in which an adult would retain all of their legal rights and the custodian would only be appointed with the consent of the ward. Uh, the, the custodian is also supposed to consult with the ward about decision making. So we can see this as a sort of intermediary guardianship tier. There was also a more, um, a fuller or more invasive form of guardianship called a trusteeship, in which in Sweden, the adult would lose most of their legal rights, except the right to vote and to get married. But this was supposed to be viewed as a last resort option. And it was supposed to be reviewed annually to determine whether the arrangement should continue. That was a serious issue. Um, even today in US courts, uh, many guardianships are appointed with no end time frame and, um, and without enough uh, um, systemic or, or uh, um, bureaucratic support to really be uh, reviewing these guardianships on a year to year basis. And we can see similar moves in other countries. For example, in 2002, Japan made a similar change in its guardianship law to have multiple tiers of guardianship. Um, if you would like to know more, I would 
invite you during the Q&A session or through you know, email to ask me about some of the other forms of alternatives to guardianship that um, US activists and reformers are advocating as a way of substituting for these plenary complete guardianships. And that includes things like durable power of attorney, appointing a trust or creating a trust and appointing an administrator, an advanced directive to make um, decisions about healthcare and the general philosophy of supported decision-making. Overall, um, it's important to note that there's an important difference between what many US states have moved towards in theory with limited or partial guardianships and the culture or attitudes towards guardianship that may not have changed in practice. And that's where we can see examples of lingering paternalism in the system. Kimberly Dayton, who is a scholar of guardianship law, warns us that even today in our era of limited guardianship, the vast majority of guardianships and conservatorships in the US are actually plenary, right? Complete or full in nature which still has the effect of stripping the ward of their ordinary rights. And legal studies of guardianship um, show that plenary guardianships are far more common than the trend that we're trying to move towards. In one case study, 87% um, of guardianships were plenary instead of limited. It was 90% in another. Sometimes it's simply the default option for judges. So we have to remember that just like in historical case studies, it's often the local legal culture that dictates whether stated reforms or intentions are actually resulting in applied changes, applied compliance with reformed procedures. All right, so this last point I wanna emphasize is really coming back to um, the experience of Britney Spears. The, the last major trend is one that comes back to the problem of power. Um, I said earlier, a filmmaker tells us that Britney Spears and her guardianship is a story about power and control. And when guardianship transfers that power from one person to a guardian, it produces a dilemma. How is the guardian going to wield that power? How should they go about making decisions on behalf of someone like Spears? And historically, there have been two ways that the question is usually answered. The dominant response is what's called best interest. And that allows the guardian to decide what they believe is best for the ward. And that's what we see um, in this quote about Spears's case, where conservatorships are designed around serving the best interest of a conservatee but they really struggle with that question of determining what that really means. Um, as one guardianship scholar points out, obviously, and in their quote, the term best interest is not self-defining, end quote. So there's a lot of room for interpretation because the guardian can focus on what they think is best for the ward um, without regard for what the ward might have done if they could make the decision themselves. And critics point out that this kind of approach reinforces a paternalistic attitude towards guardianship. So they've advocated instead for what's called substituted judgment. And this model requires the guardian to make a decision in the same manner as a ward would have, right? And it, that requires the guardian have a deeper knowledge of the person's values and choices and a sense of respect for those values. And there have been precedents of this in countries like Canada and in England. Um, and I am happy to, to talk more about how um, uh, substituted judgment is intended to try to better represent um, the autonomy and self-determination of people under guardianship. Overall, um, the substituted decision-making um, philosophy is about, you know, what I think the Yokohama Declaration, um, which is uh, really about reaffirming the rights of people under guardianship, um, the declaration captures very well with this statement 
that guardians must respect and follow the adult's wishes, values, and beliefs to the greatest possible extent. So to conclude, when we think about the total history of guardianship, we need to consider both the significant changes over time as well as the enduring continuities. It takes, uh, there we go. Uh, all right, I, I have a very active mouse wheel. So it takes work and time to change laws. But changing the letter of the law does not guarantee that changes in social attitudes or paternalistic practices or the way that judges, guardians, and families interpret the law will change as well. So when we think about the Britney Spears case and how it fits into this larger backdrop of history, I think in some ways we can see her case as unique because Britney Spears is a unique individual. But we can also see that her case is very much representative of the deeper historical problems that we've reviewed today. So at this point, I would like to hear from you. I welcome your questions about any of the issues I have presented. Um, and I thank you so much for this opportunity to, to share this research with you. Thank you, Ashley, for that presentation. And now I'll moderate our Q&A. Um, if you're in the audience and you'd like to ask a question, you have two options. Uh, we recommend that you raise your hand and I'll keep stack and I'll call on people uh, in the order in which they raise their hands. Also, if uh, given that this event is being recorded, if you prefer uh, for any reason to remain anonymous, you can type your question in the chat and I will read it to Ashley, uh, keeping in mind the order in which it's received in relation to the other questions. So. Um, at this point, we welcome your questions. Um, and maybe I, I suppose I can pose a question just to kick things off a little bit. Um, I'm curious, Ashley, given given that the Britney Spears case has has really risen to public prominence, um, I, I know that you've been watching this for a long time as a historian. Can you think of any recent, uh, other recent cases, say in the past 10 or 20 years that have raised similar issues? That, are there any other examples where the, the history of guardianship has maybe come into a public, uh, public discussion or public debate? Oh, Ashley, I think you're muted. Okay, there we go. I think on the level of a, a globally well-known celebrity, this is the aspect of Spears's case that I think is really unique. Um, during the period, the early period when Spears was put under guardianship, I believe Amanda Bynes in California was also subject to the same conservatorship process. But I think uh, what we do see, I mean, considering the fact that the, we have a very large population of people under guardianship, we also have no precise data for knowing exactly how many people because of the nature of our system. Um, so it's estimated that perhaps somewhere between 1.3 to 1.5 million people are under guardianship and approximately $50 billion in assets and property. Um, but we don't know for certain. And uh, I think that relates to how every you know, couple of years or decades in different cities around North America, we see an outbreak of newspaper headlines showcasing a local grappling with their state or city guardianship laws. Um, so there have been high profile cases um, in New York, in Florida, um, I have various bibliographies where I've tried to track some of these um, outbreaks of public reckoning. And yet there's some important continuity there, right? Because we go through this cyclical, much like many of our other public issues, right? That are dependent on the news cycle. We have a period of localized um, anxiety, um, work and reform 
but not necessarily the level of um, national reform that we see happening in other parts of the world and that um, legislators and um, disability activists have really pushed for. Thank you. And next question comes from Liz Rodriguez. Go ahead, Liz. Hi, folks. Ashley, thank you so much for this talk. Um, as a fellow early modernist, I'm always excited when people can talk about a real archive and its long history and put that into um, especially a pop cultural context. So thank you for really energizing, um, I think, a sense of scholarship here. And uh, so my question is about wards of the state, because I think what you were talking about thus far were about individual um, instances in which a family member or a court appointed conservator um, takes on this outsourced power and control um, and the discourses of like paternalism surrounding that. So I'm wondering if, uh, if you've worked on what happens when the state takes over somebody's uh, it, you know, becomes a, a conservator and like if the discourses are any different or just generally anything you want to tell us about wards of the state, I'm happy to hear. I see. Yes. Um, if I go back to this, uh, am I, I am still sharing. Yes. So you're seeing my timeline. Right. So um, I think your question um, links up best with the tradition of English common law. Um, so we see that represented in England and its colonies. Um, where the, the principle of parents patriae was about um, the role of the state as a sort of father figure over those who, deemed, who were deemed to need it, right? So this could be children who didn't have a designated um, uh, guardian or um, parent. And it was also used to refer to adults um, who uh, were deemed mentally incompetent. Um, so I think the rhetoric is very similar, even a across legal systems. It's different in the legal systems I look at within Germany and that follow Roman law, um, where there's um, really a more sort of decentralized system, where in England you might have one common um, royal office associated with the, the monarch of England that is coordinating um, in a more centralized way, guardianships of various individuals. It's quite decentralized in the German lands. But the rhetoric is similar because it's based on a premise of paternalism, of acting in a parental way and a fatherly way for those who have had that, you know, autonomy taken away. So I think that childlike and infantilizing model, even if we don't explicitly talk about it in those terms with modern guardianship, it's based on a legal system which took that as, um, you know, as a matter of fact. So thank you so much for your question. And I, as part of that, I can say, I, I haven't done deep research on the English context. It's sort of, um, it's, a, it's a different legal system, um, but we do see a lot of similarities in the outcome of how guardianship is experienced in the US and in Roman based systems. Thanks. That's super interesting. And it reminds me of knowing the English system, like bastards as being another kind of ward of the state or an often a ward of the state where no father is taking uh, credit for this kid. And so the state has to kind of shame the man into either stepping up or, you know, having having to take up public resources. So um, it's really interesting how that 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 patri patriarch model still in a different um, sphere follows. So I'll stop now. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Liz. So we have a few questions in the chat. Um, one is from Sean. Sean asks, what are the alternatives to a conservatorship? That is, is there a way to help such people without the force of law? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Because um, when we're talking about different different models of guardianship. This can mean that it's still a guardianship that is adjudicated within a court of law that has judges and a legal context, or we can talk about something that is outside of the legal system. And so um, some of the examples I gave um, were both, right? In other countries, we have seen the foundation of different types or like levels of guardianship theoretically, 
we have that in the US too with limited guardianships, but we can see that the reality is that they're not being treated as limited guardianships. So within the legal system, there may be alternatives to the traditional guardianship. But I think the question that Sean might be getting at is if we take it outside the purview of the legal system, what options are there? And that's where I've seen um, a disability advocacy groups really push for attention to the range of different options. That might have to do again with thinking about what are the specific areas of life that the person needs support with their decision making? Is it healthcare? Is it finances? Is it legal representation? Um, is it um, you know, supporting their decisions in other aspects like who they date, where they live? Um, and that's where there's um, a lot of development with um, encouraging the use of um, a legal agreement, like a durable power of attorney, where um, you can designate. And I think that what's really important here is the element of choice, having the person who's, instead of being put under guardianship, getting to exert choice on who is going to assist them and consult with them or ultimately make decisions on their behalf in an area like healthcare, finance, and so on. Um, and that sounds like it's an element that was not a part of Britney Spears's um, agency during her case experience. If she wasn't able to exert choice in terms of who represented her as a lawyer or for who her conservators were. Um, so some of those options, as well as the general philosophy of supported decision-making, which is about identifying people within your life who know you well and who might um, lend advice based on what you say you want them to help you with. So my mom is here, for example. Um, if I were setting up a situation like this, um, I would ask my mom to participate in terms of supporting my decisions about um, finances, but I might not want to set up an arrangement where my mom is advising my dating life. Sorry, mom. Um, right, so we're talking about separating out and identifying um, with the consent of the person how they can um, how they, they can create more flexibility, choice, and respect for that person's wishes where possible. Thank you, Ashley. And we have a comment and a question from Erica Miners in the chat. So the comment is as follows. Um, Erica was just reading that slightly over half of all black families today in the US will experience an investigation by child but by state child and family service agencies, these investigations are unfounded and that black and indigenous young people are overwhelmingly overrepresented in state care, such as foster systems at a cost of billions and yet uh, poverty elimination programs are derided. So, uh, so this, there's a, a question yeah. of how this would map onto today's talk. And then a more specific question is about access to capital was guardianship historically mobilized specifically in relation to access of forms of capital, i.e. were poor people more liable to be deviant uh, it, it, if no capital or symbolic capital like children was involved? Yeah, these are, so I really appreciate the comment, Erica, and I'll, I think in, with the time we have, I'll address your question. Um, I, I think there's, a very important motivating factor when it comes to capital property ownership. Um, please greet my cat, this is magic. Uh, so, and we see this reflected in terms of where, where people put their energies in terms of going to court. Um, it does revolve around property access. Um, I think especially with guardianship of both person and property, which is most of the cases that, that I see personally, um, there's that, that follows instances where there is property to be managed, to, to fight for control of. Um, what Nielsen has found in the US context with 19th and 20th, um, in the 19th and 20th centuries is that um, 
women with property are, or women are subjected to guardianship um, at much higher rates than expected, given the actual proportion of women who own property in those societies. So in terms of women and their property being put in under guardianship, there's something like 40%, but that's nowhere near the actual proportion of um, property owning women in those particular um, Wisconsin communities. So I think when we take into consideration the, the gender and the, the race bias in terms of who is targeted, um, I, I don't have the data regarding racial bias, but I think that's probably um, a very significant hunch that we're going to see discriminatory practices in terms of who's more likely to be deemed incompetent or unfit to wield those rights or have property, considering how they, these same populations of people of color were targeted in terms of rights like voting um, or citizenship rights, which are also closely linked to property access. So I also, I appreciate the recommendation. So thank you, Erica. So I've seen two more questions in the stack. Uh, first from Matthew Scanlon and then uh, Chuck Steinwedel. So go ahead, Matthew, if you still have your question. Hi, um, I'll just make a quick, do you like, uh, one of the things, just as an example for a point of reference, um, in my union network, uh, I've been fighting a lot because a lot of stuff's not in fine writing and the things like that. Do you think that if there was a much more stronger focus on like having each set of rules set out or what the regulations are in specific detail, do you think like problems like these would not be as bad because, well, that sounds kind of obvious, but what I mean is uh, the whole thing with her lawyers and it sounded like it was, everything was more up in the air and everyone just kind of accepted like, okay, she's not well enough for this, but there was no like fine details with it. And it was just kind of like he said, she said, do you think uh, having a more specific criteria or set of rules or stuff in writing would make the stuff better? Or do you think like it should just be reworked in general? I see the dilemma you pose. If part of the problem is that the law is written in such a way that it's broad and vague enough that it has to be interpreted and that through those interpretations, we see um, power hierarchies um, come into play and um, family rivalries and personal subjectivity. Um, what if we make the law more precise and detailed? Could that solve some of these problems that I've laid out? I know that I've seen critiques of that um, in part because the people who are put under guardianship, if you remember that first slide I showed with the list of all these different people who are put into this category, they come from very different backgrounds or experiences. So they're trying to produce a system that's broad and flexible enough to be adapted to a lot of individual different situations. But by leaving that flexibility, they make people vulnerable as well. So some guardians and people who work within the guardianship system have critiqued having too specific laid out of rules and guidelines because it makes them less flexible when they need to be. And that's a, that's a give and take situation, Matt, right? So we might see some benefits in terms of preventing some abuses but the, the system then might be too clunky or it might not allow flexibility in ways that's needed. My, you, you're, you asked in, in, in a way about my opinion, and I think one really important part of this is the broader culture. What people know and think about guardianship, their awareness of the issues, the assumptions we have about um, uh, who is fit and how we define those criteria. Um, considering that law is interpreted through the culture, through the society, I really think it has to happen on the level of cultural attitudes um, for us to see significant change. All right, I, I can see the problems with that. I guess it wouldn't be as simple as just changing something like that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Matt. And our final question is from Chuck. Go ahead, Chuck. Uh, 
Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, it's rare you see one that's historically deep in time and, and yet also broad comparatively, Ashley. So I really appreciate it. I guess I um, I was struck by Eric, Erica's very insightful question and thinking about Brittany in Britney Spears's case. And as I think you began in, to say in your answer that she's in some ways the opposite of, you know, the the often, you know, the, the people who are given guardians because of their, their poverty, but rather she's so wealthy. And I wondered if there's a, an age and gender dynamic specifically when it comes to having a lot of property. I mean, I think, you know, as someone who only follows the Spears case in the headlines, it seemed like there was kind of a family dynamic that you could kind of see, you know, with all this property up for grab, you know, that there's a particular sense of needing to control her and this property that goes with her. So I just wondered, is that a more sort of persistent pattern, um, as I, I think you suggested with Kim Nielsen's work? Um, do you see that historically, or is that something that's more about our sort of 21st century uh, Western capitalist system that sort of sees a kind of almost suspicion of capital in the wrong hands, if it were, if that makes sense. I'm not saying that should be that way, but the way it often yes. plays out. I think that suspicion of, um, like for example, women with capital is very evident in the early modern period. Um, in the 18th, uh, excuse me, in the 19th century, Nielsen notices that um, being a widow made, it, very much increased one's chances of being put under guardianship, not specifically because they had those provisions for widows, but on grounds of being incompetent. Um, and she's even able to track like that it's, uh, they have a much higher percentage of that happening within five years after their husband's mm -hmm. deaths. So there's also a short time frame, And I see that reflected within um, my own source base. Widows are highly represented in this court proceedings. And very often they're either to take into court by their heirs um, who are concerned about making sure that the widow's property doesn't decline under her management and it's passed along, or for very similar motives, the husband's creditors, right? He has passed away and there's a concern of getting that property out from under the hands of, um, of, of the widow or, you know, um, a, a woman um, having that much influence. So that I see represented, and I think there's some statistics that indicate the vulnerability of the elderly in general and elderly women um, in like the 1980s and 90s. But it's interesting to see that there's actually quite a mix in terms of, I think it's hard to study because there's so many jurisdictions, but I also saw that like from the 90s into the 2000s, there was a, a shift where you were having people of um, even of younger ages and of more income being, um, that's right, more income being targeted. Sorry, I'm a confused answer. It's just the guardianship system doesn't produce a lot of consistent data. And that's part of the problem of tracking um, the severity of the problem and figuring proposing solutions. Thank you. So at this point, we'll draw today's event to a close. Uh, this, the recording of this event will be appearing soon on the NEIU Libraries YouTube channel and on our social media. So please stay tuned and look for it there. I want to thank uh, all of the audience members for your excellent questions. And please join me in a warm round of digital applause for Ashley. Thank you so much for your presentation and comments here today. All right, thank you all for your attendance.